if we have an object moving in a circular path at constant velocity, it turns out, and we're going to prove it in a minute, that the acceleration vector has to be in the direction equal and opposite to that of R of t. In other words, back toward the center of the circle, making it a centripetal acceleration. Now, if the velocity isn't constant, that's no longer true. Um, but that's going to be important because what we're after is the equation of the osculating circle for an arbitrary path in three-dimensional space. Okay, so our premise is that we're on a circle, uh, magnitude, well, v, which is the magnitude of your velocity vector is constant, and I didn't actually state it because I figured r equals magnitude of r, and of course that's your r of t is also constant. Okay, well, in that case, if I take v of t, of course, it's perpendicular to r of t by the geometry of the circle and by a lot of things that we've already established, so we can safely assume this um, for many reasons. So that a short time later, v of t will have changed in direction, okay? You're going this way, and you're curving around, so a short time later you're in this direction. So your velocity vector is doing this. It's moving as it does that, but vectors can be moved anywhere. So if we write the v of t and a v of t plus delta t vector with a common point, even though they don't occur in the circle at common points still, those are two uh, vectors, then the delta v, the change in v, between these two points, or between time t and t plus delta t, is going to be the vector from here to here. And as we saw, because we did this in class yesterday, uh, as, as we established and just reminded you, uh, that this is an isosceles triangle. Why? Because the magnitude of v is constant. This side is equal to this side. It makes it an isosceles triangle. makes these two angles equal. Now, as delta t approaches zero, you move less and less, so your velocity vector changes by less and less, so your delta v shrinks up, and this triangle shrinks toward a straight line. For every such triangle, you can do delta v over delta t. And, of course, your delta v over delta t, your delta v vector over delta t, is your acceleration vector. So in the limit, your delta v over delta t approaches your acceleration, your instantaneous acceleration, at whatever time it is. And I could have written a of t, but I didn't. Also, since these two angles are equal, as this angle approaches zero, since all three angles add up to 180 degrees, these two angles add up to of quantity closer and closer to 180 degrees, that approaches 180 degrees as a limit, so that these two angles approach 90 degrees, so that we see that the delta v is perpendicular to your v vector in the limit. So that the limiting value of the delta v vector is perpendicular to the v vector, so in the limit, when this approaches a, the a vector has to be perpendicular to your v vector. Okay. Now, let's figure out in terms of your velocity and your radius just what the magnitude of A happens to, to be. Okay, so uh, again, R is the magnitude of your R of T, that's constant. V, which is the magnitude of your velocity vector, magnitude of the derivative of your position vector, is constant. Well, there are many ways to do this. I chose to introduce the idea of the angular velocity omega equals v over r. That's your angular velocity, okay? And this just goes back to the definition of a radian, okay? The angle omega default measure is radians, and the number of radians is, um, oh, actually the default measure of angle is radians per second. Um, v is in units of distance per second along the arc, and r is in units of distance. When you do v over r by the definition of radian and a little bit of manipulation, you find that uh, 
omega is the number of radians per second through which you're moving. So, in an interval delta t, you have the same triangle you had before, and this angle down here is the number of radians per unit of time, that's omega, which is d over r, remind you, times your time interval. So you're going at uh, 20 radians per second for a millisecond, means you go 2.02 .02 radians, so this angle would be 0.02 radians, okay? And uh, you know, that would be in the order of a degree, a little more than a degree. It takes about a little less than 60 degrees, 57.1 degrees, I think, to make a radian. Okay. Now the point is, uh, if delta t is very small, then alpha is a very small angle, and you get all this and so forth. Um, but the big thing you get is these velocity vectors are on a circle about the common point here. And from the geometry of that circle, delta v is going to be your alpha times v. So the magnitude of your delta v here is alpha times v. Now, when you do delta v over delta t, you get your magnitude of your acceleration. That means then that you're doing alpha v over delta t. And alpha is just, again, omega delta t. So you're doing omega delta t over delta t times v. And that's omega v. Then in the limit, delta v over delta t, the limit is delta t goes to zero, delta v over delta t approaches your acceleration, dv dt, and that's going to be omega v, but omega is v over r, so you've got v over r times v, so that your acceleration, which is dv dt, is v squared over r. That's your acceleration. Your acceleration is perpendicular to your velocity, your velocity is perpendicular to your r. Your acceleration then is back toward the center. Now, I haven't established that the acceleration is back toward the center as opposed to out that way, but it's obvious from this diagram that it must be. And you can shore that up into a proof if you uh, wish. It's a good exercise. Okay? So we get that a is perpendicular to v, v is perpendicular to r. So a is parallel to r but in the opposite direction. Again, it's the opposite direction thing that I haven't proven. Everything else is proven by this argument, if you understand the definition of radian measure. Okay? So now we have that the acceleration is v squared over r. And what we're going to want to look at is, if you're on a motion around a curve, at any given point, you have a perpendicular component of your acceleration that we've learned how to calculate very easily. I mean, it's not trivial, but it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's not too difficult to understand with little practice. So we can always calculate, if we have our r of t function in the proper form, uh, our acceleration, our perpendicular component of the acceleration vector. Well, that is the centripetal acceleration at this point. You have a velocity at this point, so you have a speed at this point. Well, that means that temporarily, just for this instant, if, if for no other, you're moving a along an arc of a circle at speed b with a centripetal acceleration a, so you can determine the radius of that circle. So, from this, you can determine where the center of the circle is, so you can determine the equation of the circle. Now, that's not a trivial process. It's called the osculating circle. It's not uh, the easiest thing you're going to encounter in this course, but certainly not the hardest. So we're going to develop that.